Hello, my name is Lawrence Burian, and on behalf of the American Society for Yad Vashem, it is my pleasure to introduce you to an important conversation in our series, Lessons from Our Parents. This series features entrepreneurs, philanthropists, builders, educators, and dreamers who proudly lay claim to being children of Holocaust survivors. We will explore how these parents' experiences influenced and continue to profoundly impact their children's personal and professional lives and gain insight into the lessons their parents taught them that made them into the leaders they are today. It is my pleasure today to have this conversation with President Lawrence Bacow. Lawrence Bacow is the 29th president of Harvard University. One of higher education's most widely experienced leaders, President Bacow is committed to supporting scholarship and research, encouraging civic engagement, and expanding opportunity for all. From 2001 to 2011, he was president of Tufts University, where he fostered collaboration and advanced the university's commitment to excellence in teaching, research, and public service. Prior to Tufts, he spent 24 years on the faculty of MIT, including serving as chair of the faculty and as chancellor. President Bacow received an SB in economics from MIT, a JD from Harvard Law School, an MPP from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and a PhD in public policy from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Prior to his election as Harvard president in February 2018, President Backhau served as a member of the Harvard Corporation, a Hauser leader in residence at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and as a president in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. President Backhau was raised in Pontiac, Michigan by parents who were both immigrants. He and his wife, Adele Fleet Bacow, were married in 1975 and have two adult sons. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you. Uh, I think it would be really helpful to our viewers if we could just start, uh, if you would share with us a, a brief overview um, of your mother's story as a Holocaust survivor and your father's background as an immigrant who faced persecution. Sure. Um, so my father, let me start with him, um, was born in Minsk uh, and uh, came to this country as a child before the war, although his family came to basically escape the pogroms. Um, in fact, he always used to say his earliest memory as a, as a child was, was hiding in a ditch as uh, people were coming through, uh, breaking windows and, and burning, burning down houses. Um, my mother was born in Germany um, in a small farming village outside of Frankfurt. Uh, it was called Londorf, a village of about 900 people. Uh, my grandfather was a cattle broker. Um, Londorf had um, about uh, 20 Jewish families. Uh, and uh, my mother and her parents and her sister um, lived there um, quite uh, peacefully, um, uh, until Hitler came to power. Uh, my grandfather uh, had lost an arm in World War I, um, had married late in life, uh, and uh, my grandparents and my mother's family actually had a chance to get out of Germany and I think it was about 1936. Uh, but my grandfather, according to my mother, said, what's a one-armed cattle broker who doesn't speak English going to do in the United States? And also, he noted that Germany had traditionally been um, quite good to its disabled war veterans. Oh, he, he lost his arm fighting for Germany in World War I. He did, war. in World War I. Um, so, uh, so sadly, they stayed. Um, they wound up being um, transported to Theresienstadt, um, where um, uh, actually my uh, grandparents died in Theresienstadt. My mother's older sister was separated from the family uh, in Theresienstadt. It's a sad story in its own right. Uh, she spoke fluent French, and there were some uh, French Jews who, who came to Theresienstadt and didn't understand the instructions they were being given by, um, by the guards. And so 
uh, my aunt translated uh, for them. And uh, this was at a time in which people were under instructions not to speak to, you know, uh, new prisoners. And so she was separated from the family. Um, and uh, sadly, she died in Ravensbrook. Um, on um, what turned out, my mother learned was the last day of the war. Um, what, what was her name? Um, her name was Inga, uh, and uh, she died, uh, I think it was um, due to tuberculosis uh, that she had contracted um, there. Um, towards the end of the war, my mother always said that she thought that if uh, they could have stayed in Theresienstadt, that she and her parents would have survived. Uh, but towards the end of the war, they were transported to Auschwitz. And um, it was a classic case of, you know, her parents went one way. And she went the other, uh, and she never, uh, she never saw them again. And uh, she uh, spent about six weeks um, in Auschwitz before being moved uh, to a labor camp uh, nearby, um, where she was ultimately liberated by the Russians um, at the end of the war, who also liberated Auschwitz. You know, I, I had an opportunity uh, to listen to an audio interview that your mom gave uh, that was very powerful about her experiences. And one of the things that she said, if I recall correctly, more than one time throughout the interview was that how hard she tried to actually forget her experiences during the war. In fact, the interview was hard for her because she had tried for so long to, to not talk about about the war, which is, you know, a common experience among survivors. I, I'm curious, what was it like for you as a child of a survivor? And when did your mom start to open up to you and, and share with you her experiences? Was it age appropriate? How did that, how did that unfold? So uh, I have an older sister um, uh, who's two years older, and we always knew that my mother was a survivor. Um, and... Uh, you know, after the war, she came and lived with an aunt and uncle who had left Germany in 1936 and um, who left Lundorf. And uh, this aunt and uncle sort of were my surrogate grandparents because uh, my mother was the only member of her family who survived and actually the only Jew from her town of Lundorf um, who survived the war as well. And so we were obviously quite aware um, of this, but growing up, my mother didn't speak about it um, much. Uh, if there was something on TV about the Holocaust, either the channel would get changed or my mother would leave the room. Um, but I had a very, I think, atypical experience as a child of a survivor uh, because my mother was um, very outgoing. Uh, she wasn't neurotic in the least. Uh, she was not overly protective of my sister or me. Uh, to the contrary. Um, in fact, my mother had an expression. If uh, Lenny and I ever worried about anything, my mother would say to us, what's the worst that can happen? Can you live with that? Uh, then why worry? Um, she was, uh, you know, within the family, everybody's favorite aunt. She was, you know, my friends used to love to come to our house because uh, it was a very happy home and my mother was very outgoing and would sort of uh, greet all of my friends. She was a fabulous baker, so there were always homemade cookies. That, that's more. That's more typical. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was aware of it, um, but it wasn't the center of my existence. And in fact, when I, I had, I was very active in USY as a kid, um, a United Synagogue youth. And I remember I had friends from USY who were children of survivors who had completely different experiences uh, from mine. My mother didn't really start talking about. Um, her experience uh, openly uh, until she had a heart attack when she was, well, let's see, that would have been, Jay was born in, our eldest son was born in 1979. Um, and so uh, she would have been in 1979, she would have been uh, 42. Um, and uh, excuse me, 52, excuse me, 52 in 1979. And, and that's when she started speaking um, about it. I think when she realized her own mortality. And the tape that you probably listened to was my sister, uh, I suspect, interviewing my mother. And then she, I think, felt an obligation to let us know 
uh, about her experiences and um, you know she uh, wrote about them some and uh, that's really when I got to know them in far greater detail uh, and at that point I was you know um, myself um, into my 40s so so your your description of your mom um, is not surprisingly consistent with something you said during your inaugural address at Harvard uh, as president, where you said, I, I'm, I'm quoting, my mother survived Auschwitz as a teenager, lived without bitterness, and always was grateful that America was so good to her. So I, you, you, you kind of anticipated my next question, which is, um, how do you suppose it is that your mother was able to live without bitterness when you describe the unimaginable losses that she sustained? Well, you know, she was um, a remarkably strong woman, um, but also, um, I think, quite centered when she went into the camps. Um, uh, my wife and I talked to her about this and asked her. Uh, and uh, she said, first of all, during her time in the camps, she never allowed herself to imagine that she might not survive. Um, so she said she didn't allow herself to go there. She just always assumed that she would make it. Um, but the Remind me, I'm sorry, how old was she in the camps around? Um, she was about um, 15 when she went into the camps. But then she said something which I, uh, to this day, I find even more remarkable. Because she said that, you know, by the time she was liberated, Hitler had literally stolen from her everything that she cared about. You know, her parents, her sister, her friends, her home, her life, everything was basically gone. And she said, she made a very, very conscious decision. She said, you know, I could have been angry and bitter for the rest of my life, um, or I could live life to its fullest, and that would be my revenge. And so it was a conscious decision on her part. She said, if, if she had remained obsessed by this, consumed by it, angry, bitter, then, as she put it, Hitler would have won. Uh, but this was her way of triumphing over, over evil. I don't know many people who could have done it. Um, I doubt that I could have done it. But she did. Uh, and in that respect, uh, she was truly, truly a remarkable woman. You know, if you've read uh, any of the Viktor Frankl works and, and the progeny of um, other psychologists who've come from that uh, school of thought, there's a lot of talk about the, the, this mental choice that uh, no matter what the situation is, this ability to choose life and to make a choice about how you're going to um, uh, address the situation. It's, it's fascinating. It sounds like your mother uh, was a living example of what Viktor Frankl writes about. You know, she was, you know, I, I still think of her as one of the um, most optimistic uh, people um, I ever knew. Um, somebody who um, truly embraced life, um, was filled with gratitude, um, and always sort of focused on what she had, not what she lost. I mean, that's not to say that um, she didn't have very, very strong feelings um, about Germany, about Germans. I mean, I grew up in a home in which we owned nothing that was German. Um, all right. Absolutely nothing. Um, my mother made a point of ensuring that my sister and I would not learn a word of Germany, German. Um, so uh, she clearly had very, very strong feelings. Um, but she was able to control them, subvert them, and, and sort of embrace all that was good in her life. And, and so I think one of the things which I learned from my mother is she did not live life um, in the rearview mirror. In other words, she was always looking forward, not back. So, so um you had this kind of dichotomy where you have a, a mother who is this positive force um, 
But on the other hand, there's taboo topics. She's going to leave the yeah. room. Uh, she's not going to have German. And then you mentioned that you would go into some of your social circles and 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 see friends who had a very different experience. So pivoting from your mom to you personally, how did you feel as a child? Were you proud of it? Was it uh, was it embarrassing for you? And 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 also importantly, how does that how do you translate both the positive lessons that you learned about this will to live and this positivity to your own children? And how do you teach them about the Holocaust? Like, how, how does that translate through the generations? You know, I was never embarrassed by my mother, um, ever. Um, so, um, you know, she was my mother. It's, she seemed like the most normal person in the world. Um, and I think she was normal, not just to me, but to, to everybody. Um, I certainly was cognizant of the fact that uh, she had led, an, uh, you know, a life that was filled with tragedy. Um, you know, I'm named for my grandfather, my sister's named for my grandmother. So, I mean, and we were well aware of that. Um, but it was it was not something that was, how shall I put it? My mother didn't wear it on her sleeve. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was there. It was who she was. And, um, and so, you know, I embraced all of that. You know, that, that's who my mother was. Uh, so as I said, I think I had a very normal, um, existence. She was not protective, uh, overly protective. Um, she didn't, um, uh, use guilt. Um, as I think is, you know, as I've learned, a common uh, phenomenon for anybody who's Jewish to use it to their advantage. But also, uh, you know, sadly, I think the, the, the story of many children of survivors is that, you know, they've had to deal with parents who've said, oh, I've suffered so much. How could you do this, uh, you know, to me? Never, ever, ever dealt with that um, uh, with, my, with my mother. You know, how did it affect the way in which we raised our children? You know, we have a friend who said something to us when we became parents, which has always stayed with me. And they said that, you know, um, actually, uh, she said this when we became grandparents. Uh, she said, when you become grandparents, your children give you a grade on how they think you've done as a parent. Because all you need to do is watch what they replicate in terms of, how they were raised, and watch what they run from. And I would say, you know, um, we raised our kids as as we were raised. Um, you know, uh, uh, I was, both my wife and I, even though we grew up, you know, 1,200 miles apart, Adele's from Jacksonville, Florida, our, our families shared very, very common values. And... Um, we both grow up, grew up in homes with a very strong Jewish identity. Um, and, you know, that's how we raised our children. Um, we, you know, our parents encouraged us to be independent. We encouraged our kids to be independent. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have said to our kids, you know, when they worried about something, what's the worst that could happen? You know, can you live with that? Then why worry? Um, and, you know, my mother had actually seen the worst that could happen. Um, so... You know, if 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 the way you raised your children was a was a a grade on on your parents raising you and how they're raising their children, you know, let's just be glad that nobody audited these classes, that they're not pass fail, that uh, you don't have a TA handling the the responsibilities. Uh, it sounds like from what you're describing, uh, uh, the values have stuck. I think they have. You know, we were a very close family growing up, and you know, we're a close family now, and I think our children. Who each have two kids of their own, you know. Um, uh, also, are are you know they and their spouses and are very very close with their kids. So, let's shift for a bit um, from your private life more into your public your public role. Um, you know, when we talk about these values, something that I, I've seen you uh, through my just reading up a, a bit about you in advance that I've seen you very proudly identify as a child of a survivor, and you've noted. 
that you're the son of two immigrants who I think the quote was something like, between the two of them, they had one suitcase or two suitcases when they came to the United States. How does being the son of an immigrant, of two immigrants, affect uh, your policies of, as president of a, of a, of a major university? Uh, do you have a special place uh, for, in your own mind or activities for foreign students or uh, first generation Americans? How, how does that translate from a policy perspective? Well, no, it very much affects me. I mean, I, I do make a point of telling people that not just were my parents immigrants, but in their own way, each of them were refugees. You know, my, my mother came to this country on the second liberty ship that brought refugees from Europe after World War II. Um, landed at the Brooklyn Naval Yard, because if you came on a troop ship, that's what the, the liberty ships were that brought refugees. They didn't enter through Ellis Island. They went to the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I've commented many, many times to different groups that where else in the world can you go literally in one generation from off the boat with, to a first approximation, nothing. To, Only to, in America. Only in America. But, but to rise and become the president of Harvard. And, you know, I think that higher education plays an important role in that story. And so one thing that motivates me, one of the reasons why I do what I do, is to ensure that future generations um, have the same kind of opportunity that so many of us have been blessed to enjoy. Um, it is why I tell the story. It, it's why I tell it at a moment in time in which many people are questioning the role of immigration to this country. Um, it's why, you know, in a message to the Harvard community uh, uh, a year ago, my opening message uh, at the beginning of the year, I made a point of noting that, you know, um, the government was debating policies that if adopted, um, and had they been in effect, you know, um, years ago, I wouldn't be having this conversation with him because my parents would not have been privileged to have gained entry into this country. So, you know, I, I think it definitely affects how I do what I do, um, why I spoke out strongly and, in fact, uh, filed a suit against the federal government earlier this year to set aside a rule that the government had adopted that would have required foreign students in this country uh, to return home um, under threat of deportation if their schools had switched to all online education as a result of the pandemic. You know, I, I, I think it's important to be able to, to stand up um, for those who in many cases don't have a voice to stand up for themselves. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why I agreed to take this job. Uh, the presidency of Harvard, for better or worse, comes with a bully pulpit. And I'm, I'm trying to, to use it um, to, for lack of a better word, repair the world uh, to Kunalam. So when we think about that mission... Um, and the role of higher education, as you as you noted in in that mission, uh, something that I have always struggled with um, as a student of history is 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 Germany. Uh, Pre-war Germany was arguably one of the most enlightened uh, and well-educated of, of of nations in the world. You know, the University of Berlin and and other. Uh, institutions of, of, of higher learning. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the universities at the time failed miserably uh, if, if their goal was to shape not just students, but moral and ethical people. Um, so my question to you, uh, assuming you agree with the premise, but even if you don't, um, as an educator, as the, as the president of preeminent university, uh, do you see our current day institutions of higher learning doing a better job at building character? Is that actually part of the mission or is it not? Um, and if it is part of the mission, it, it, are, are, we, are we progressing? Well, you know, I think character is formed um, largely before students actually get to places like ours. Um, and in fact, through the admissions process, one of the things which we try to do 
is to screen people based upon uh, character. We look for people of good moral character. We look for people who put others before self. We look for people who are committed um, to using the gifts which they've been given uh, to make the world a better place. Um, and if somebody is lacking those at the age of 18 or 19, um, they're probably not likely to discover them um, in the four years that they're in college, wherever they go. Now, that said, I do think that we have a responsibility to try and provide the right messages, to teach the right lessons, uh, to instill in our students a sense of responsibility, a sense of obligation uh, for others. And, and we do that. Um, do we do it perfectly? No. Uh, but certainly we try. I also think it's important that we teach our students the lessons of history. Um, and you're absolutely right that, um, you know, especially when it comes to Jews, Jews were incredibly assimilated um, in Germany um, pre-Hitler uh, and occupied positions of extraordinary prominence in all the professions, um, in civil society, in the academy. Uh, and, you know, one of the lessons which we should take, and in fact, my mother used to say this, um, I will never forget it, but my mother used to say, you know, people think it can't happen here, uh, but it can. And so I do think that requires uh, eternal vigilance. It requires a, a respect for and a, a willingness to embrace and defend the institutions of democracy. Um, it requires us to understand that we cannot take what we have here for granted. Um, and it requires us to be willing to raise a moral voice in response to injustice anywhere that we see it. Um, not just for injustices suffered by Jews, but injustice suffered by anyone. And I think that if we are to truly teach the lessons of the Holocaust, that's perhaps the most important lesson that we can, that we can teach. That if you ask what would have prevented the Holocaust, I'd like to think it would have been if early on, if more people of goodwill had been, been willing to stand and raise a strong moral voice and say, no, this is wrong. Um, and to stand by those, um, you know, who were being uh, uh, rounded up, whether or not they were Jews or gypsies or homosexuals or others, um, and say, you know, uh, this is this is wrong. We we all must stand together. Yeah, I mean, the problem with the silent majority is that they're silent, and right. there's. Um, there's a lot of evidence that when people showed um, uh, a, a backbone, it, 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 that they're, they're, they were able to have great accomplishments. Uh, not everyone, but they were able to. Um, you know, I, I, I it, it was a interesting uh, uh, point you made. You made many interesting points, but in particular, the fact that people, when they come to a college campus, they're they're mostly fully formed, at least from a ethical and moral uh, perspective. But at the same time, um, you know, in this period of particular political polarization and social unrest, we, we do see college campuses as, as a, uh, for better and for worse, as a hotbed of activity and, and a drive for change, both positive or, or otherwise. And, you know, you, you mentioned the lessons of the Holocaust, and there, there are many, right? The, the, uh, the messages you, you, you flagged of, of tolerance and respect for the dignity of all human beings and standing up for what's right, et cetera. Um, do you think that the, the Holocaust education can play a more targeted role in, on campus? Is there a place for that? I don't know if you have this data, like, is, are there more people expressing an interest? in those kinds of studies and learning those lessons? Uh, can, can, we, can we actually translate those lessons through teaching the Holocaust or is it just one of, or, or, or is that not a, a, great, uh, a great mode? Well, so one of the challenges that we face is that, um, you know, uh, 
the Holocaust, uh, sadly, is viewed as distant history by many, you know, current students. And if we just think, you know, I went to college in 1969, and, you know, here we are at, at this point, um, you know, 75 years after World War II, um, and, you know, we would have been talking in an equivalent amount of time to things that happened in the, you know, the late 1800s when I went to college. Um, so, so one must find ways of, of making things relevant and, and, uh, having people be able to identify with them. And, but sadly, there are all too many examples throughout the world of, of people being oppressed, uh, of people being, um, subjugated by others, uh, people taking advantage of, uh, of other people, of, of those who are demonizing others because of their differences, uh, for them. So, you know, we don't, we don't have far to look in order to find such examples. Um, when I was at Tufts, we did something which I think, uh, was an interesting way of teaching the Holocaust. And that is, uh, Hillel at Tufts sponsored a program, um, which was underwritten by Seth, um, Marin and his wife, Ann Heyman which was called the Moral Voices Program. And each year what it did is that it would bring somebody to campus who had, in fact, successfully raised a moral voice in response to injustice somewhere in the world. And um, this person would come and spend, you know, four or five days uh, with us. They would meet with students. They would give a major lecture. They would uh, actually teach Torah with the Hillel rabbi um, on campus. And this proved to be a very, very popular um, event, especially the large major lecture, which would fill the largest lecture hall um, or auditorium at Tufts. Um, and students um, of all persuasions uh, would come. And, and we would have people, uh, the first Marin lecture was uh, Paul Rusesa Begina, um, who was the proprietor of the Hotel Rwanda, if you remember the film. In fact, sadly, he was just um, arrested um, uh, as uh, being a revolutionary in, in, in Rwanda these days. So some things continue to go on. Um, but also, um, it you know, uh, Nick Kristof came um, at one point, New York Times columnist who's you know, written extensively uh, about some of the injustices that people experience uh, around the world. Um, we brought um, different activists, um, environmental activists, civil rights activists, um, uh, people who had managed to to stand up and and bravely uh, say no, this is wrong. In in many cases, at great personal risk. In some cases, not. But people who we could put forward as exemplars um, who had successfully done this to show that it can be done and that it needs to be done um, and it needs to be done over and over and over again. And that's all of our responsibilities. And these were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It's fabulous because it lets somebody actually have a living, breathing role model that when they're confronted exactly. with a difficult choice, they can remember that person who stood before them and spoke to them and actually inspired them. It's a great idea. I hope somebody watching this gets inspired to be uh, the uh, in, in, someone to endow that exact program. Um, look, I, I think that uh, you know the the fact that you're the the child of immigrants and a, a and of parents who f who fled persecution, um, and that we have that story to tell should should be inspiring to many students again who we we have no monopoly on suffering um and oppression but should be a, a, somehow in this world of intersectionality and the like to be able to better build bridges across different communities and cultures on campus or outside with with positive messages you mentioned you know the holocaust is ancient history in some ways and i could imagine that for somebody who's not living it the way we are uh, that's how it would feel uh, the more we can translate it from teaching the history or about death and suffering and more about values and principles that someone can take away, uh, th the better. It's certainly part of the mission of Yad Vashem uh, to, yes. to transmit those principles. And having you 
uh, participated exactly what you're doing in a, in a, in a, in a segment like this is part of transmitting those, those positive messages and, and, and lessons, uh, from our parents. Um, with your permission, uh, if it would be okay, we'd love to segue uh, a bit to a different uh, part of this uh, interview um, into something that we like to call the lightning round. And right. the, the goal of the lightning round is really just for our viewers to get a chance um, to, to better know you in the short time that we have. And okay. um, it's completely off topic. So uh, the, it's it's not about the Shoah, the Holocaust, but it's really just to have some fun. So if you're, if you're game, <clears throat> go for it. All right. Excellent. The goal here is uh, quick answers fast. Okay. All right. If you're uncomfortable I'll, with the question, I'll try. I'm not always that quick. You know, part of the problem, academics want to think about things. I know, I know. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Ready? I'm on. Nearly 35 Harvard graduates have become professional hockey players in the National Hockey League. What is it? I know that's a great stat. What is it about a Harvard education that prepares young men to have their teeth knocked out? Oh, because they um, they like to go do battle with you know uh, with other people with sticks in their hands. Exactly. That's what we that's what we saw on the Harvard website. Um, what is what is the most bizarre complaint you've ever received from a faculty member? How about from a student or a parent? Um, I once received a message from a parent that uh, she was outraged that we were serving hydrogenated vegetable oil uh, in the cafeterias. I hope you put an end to that immediately. I referred her to food services. I see. You delegated. It's a skill of management. Hey, absolutely. It was above my, the, the, the vegetable oil that we serve is above my pay grade as president. Um, talking about food, I, I gather you have a favorite food. Um, in all of your travels across this great country of ours, where have you had the very best frozen yogurt? Oh, the best frozen yogurt, you actually, um, that's, that's, that's a hard one. There are two places. Um, we were very, very fond of a place which we live very close to in Brookline, Massachusetts, which sadly is, is closed. And that's called 16 Handles. And yep, there's another change. great frozen yogurt place um, in Sarasota, Florida, where we spend some time called Yogurtology. That's still open. And right now that remains our favorite. That, that could be a liberal arts course. Making great frozen yogurt is a life skill. Oh, it is a skill. You know, in this world of everybody, everything is customized and personalized. It's completely consistent with the zeitgeist, you know, being able to, right. you make your own, it's tailored, it's personal, yep. right? Um, uh, give us your best Boston accent saying, park your car in the Harvard yard. Well, you know, I grew up in Michigan, so I don't have a Boston accent. But your mom. Uh, but, if I, your, but if I did, it would sound like Pakyaka and Havid Yad. Oh, that's well done. Can we do that one more time? Pakyaka and Havid Yad. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, here's one that if, if you want to think about it, we'll give you an extra, an extra beat. Okay. Um, I have a high school age niece. Um, if she on her own was to discover the cure for COVID, would her odds of being admitted to Harvard go up to at least 4%? Well, actually, they'd be higher than that because if she just applies randomly, they're at about 4.5%. Okay, so it wouldn't ruin her odds to discover the cure for COVID. No, no, I don't think so. But she would have to do it before the age of 14, you know. Uh, <laughs> right, right. And, and, and in 250 words or less, describe how that occurred. Exactly. Admissions is above my pay grade. I don't get involved right. in that. Either, exactly. We would delegate that there too. I think the Dean of Admissions at Harvard has the har hardest job in the university. So given your, your long tenure as a president at Tufts and, and now uh, at Harvard, um, here's a would you rather question. Would you rather sit through another commencement ceremony or wait online at the DMV? Oh, I'm a commencement junkie. I love commencements. Come on. 
That's just not possible. I can't go to my own kids' commencements without, <laughs> without getting bored. <laughs> Look, if uh, I think commencement is fabulous, and the reason I think it's fabulous is that I love looking at the faces of the parents. And, uh, you know, just such extraordinary pride and joy, and especially parents um, who, as we were discussing earlier, are people who may have struggled to come to this country or may have been born here but never had the privilege of an education of their own, and to see their son or their daughter, you know, graduate from a place like, you know, Harvard or MIT or Tufts, the three places that you know, that I've spent my career at, I, I think there's nothing better. That's because you get to sit looking at the audience, right? The audience doesn't get that opportunity. So maybe that's the disconnect. Well, they're always happy faces. If for no other reason than they're free from tuition. <laughs> they're, free, <laughs> they're free from tuition. Um, talking about tuition, um, an online subscription to Netflix or Amazon Prime costs about twelve ninety nine a month. Um, it's actually only $9.99 for Spotify. Um, Harvard is online this year uh, for only $70,000. Um, does that come with or without pop-up ads? Well, first of all, um, we're actually online for much less than seventy. dollars uh, you know, because we're not charging room and board for students who are, you know, studying, uh, studying from home. Uh, we've worked very, very hard to make sure that they still have an extraordinary educational experience. But for those who didn't want to do it, we were very liberal in saying to them, you know, take the year off. That's fine with us. Come back next year when things are more normal. But if you are watching online, there's no, you know, there's no advertising. There's no advertising, no advertising. Um, and uh, the, the reports I have actually from students it's, is that it's, and from faculty, is that it's quite different from what happened last spring. As I think you know, when most of our institutions sent their kids home in March, our, our faculty only had about a week to um, switch or pivot to teaching online and to Zooming. Uh, we've spent the better part of the last four or five months preparing for this, and so the courses are much more sophisticated. In fact, you should... Uh, you should check some of them out because you can actually um, see some of them uh, if you if you go to Harvard X, which is our, our online portal. That's fabulous. Um, okay, um, just a few more. You're an engineer, an an environmentalist, uh, and a lawyer. Um, I guess not. Actually, an engineer. I'm not an engineer. I'm a, I'm a, a lawyer and an economist. Um, right. You're a an lawyer engineer. and an economist. The question's still going to yes. work, which is, was your mother terribly disappointed that you didn't go to med school? Uh, you know, no. Uh, actually, um, I. it's interesting. I, was, I went to MIT in part because I was very good at math and science and I loved it. Uh, but I never wanted to be a doctor and I was never pushed to be a doctor. So... Um, my father was actually disappointed that I didn't practice law, but that's a much longer story. Um, I had to become president of, of Tufts in order for him to get over it. Well, I'm sure there are people who are wondering, uh, talking about uh, law school, uh, Harvard Law School and Legally Blonde, compare and contrast. Never saw the movie Legally Blonde. Oh, we got to fix that. I didn't have to see the movie. I, you know, um, I went. To wasn't part of, wasn't part of the interview process, the application no. process. All right, so we're gonna we're, uh, just uh, two more. Um, Lawrence Lowell and Lawrence Summers are past presidents of Harvard. Now there's you, Lawrence Bacow. Um, is it true that I, Lawrence Burian, am on the short list to succeed you? Um, especially, you wouldn't have to change your monogram towels. My last name is Burian, so LB. I, I, I've heard the rumor. Is that true? Well, not only is it true, but I'm expecting you to move into the president's house next week, and then you can inherit all the Taurus that I've been dealing with. Lawrence, it's all yours. I just want you to know that part of my um, 
uh, my um, set of initiatives that I would present to the Harvard Corporation is A, no hydrogenated vegetable oil. I would rectify that immediately. I wouldn't delegate. Um, and I have seen Legally Blonde and could speak to it um, and really take some of the learnings from the film um, and apply it to the law school. But I'm not trying to, you know, not trying to make you feel any kind of pressure. I'll make sure when I step down that the uh, that the new search committee is is has got your contact information. Excellent. So last question. Um, I, I assume that you regret terribly uh, the decision to be called Larry and not Lawrence. Um, and the question is, would you say that that's your largest life regret or just one of several? Oh, um, it's one of many, um, I, I have to say. Um, you know, it's it's right up there with uh, not playing center field for the Detroit Tigers, who I grew up with. Um, but, you know, uh, part of life is learning how to overcome adversity and deal with disappointment. So, Well, you're, if you, the lesson from your mother would be just not to look back. And, you know, you, you, you went with Larry and you're sticking with Larry and uh, just not to let it bog you down. Well, and in fact, um, on campus, um, when I introduce myself to, uh, to students and to others, I always say, call me Larry. Um, it's not President Backow. So it's, it's worked for me this long. I'm going to stick with it. So, um, President Backow, uh, at, at, at your Harvard inauguration, uh, Rabbi, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but... Garden Swartz. Garden Swartz. Uh, offered blessings drawn from what you had learned from your teachers and parents. And he explicitly referenced your mother, uh, who, as you mentioned, uh, had taught you the value of, uh, uh, of optimism and positivity. He mentioned that your mom uh, taught you the value of working behind a counter and meeting people in all walks of life. And the rabbi said, and I'm, I'm quoting, Lord, help Larry bring the values of openness, service, inclusiveness, and decency, what your parents would call menschlichkeit, to this sacred covenanted community of Harvard. And even from this very brief interaction with you and the generosity of your time, it's clear that Harvard has at its helm somebody who is a mensch and is trying to bring the values uh, of your parents forward, and what an amazing bully pulpit you do have to to present uh, those lessons learned from your parents. Uh, any closing remarks you'd like to share with our with our viewers? Well, first of all, thank you for those very kind words. Um, I'm only sorry my parents aren't around to hear them, um, but also thank you for the good work that you are doing um, to on behalf of Yad Vashem. Uh, uh, on behalf of those who sadly no longer have a voice because their voice was stilled, um, and to make sure that uh, future generations are able to both um, understand why it's important that a Yad Vashem exists and what that should imply for how they should live their lives uh, to make sure that we, we don't have to build more Yad Vashem's um, going forward. So thank you for what you're doing um, and for your good work. It's a pleasure to have had the conversation. It was a real honor. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with me, getting to know President Larry Bacow and hearing about the profound impact his mother, a Holocaust survivor, had on his personal and professional life. As the son of a Holocaust survivor myself, I know just how deeply our parents' lives helped shape our own and the meaningful lessons that we learned firsthand from the bravest people we know. The lessons taught by people like Mrs. Ruth Bacow are those of resilience, the ability to respond to the evils of the Shoah through healing, the ability to recover by building trust and planning for the future, and the ability to thrive by inspiring others and building for future generations. Please join the American Society for Yad Vashem at one of our upcoming virtual galas to celebrate six noteworthy individuals who embody 
the spirit of resilience. Your support of the important work of Yad Vashem has never been more important. I invite you to go to yadvashemusa.org to find out more.